Thank you all. I'm delighted to be here, actually to return here as uh, uh, as he has said in the bio, as long the what you can conclude from my bio is that I'm not as young as I used to be. But in there are, were two stints here on campus at the National Defense University. Once as a student at the National War College, where the prime uh, mission is to get us to be strategic thinkers and think about national security strategy. I had to spend a year doing that. You get a week to do that all to learn all of that. And so the burden on, on your uh, presenters is very, very high to kind of bring the richness of that discussion to our discussions there. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, for this morning's panel. Uh, you come at a very interesting time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the political moment in the United States and the transition uh, and put in context uh, the time where you visit with us. Then talk a little bit about the security development nexus and how over time our two missions as development actors and security actors have moved closer together and why that is. Some challenges that we see in the development sphere that are equally applicable to the security sphere. And then finally, some tools of our trade that I think will, may be helpful and may resonate with the kind of analysis and thinking and execution that you all are doing. So transition, security development nexus, some challenges, and then some tools. And uh, Aziz, you caught me off at the right time, and uh, we'll make room for uh, dialogue in our other speaker. Um, so let me talk about the, the transition. Uh, I was telling Kate I should first uh, thank uh, both Aziz and Kate Omquist-Knopf and Ray Gilpin for the invitation to be here. Uh, I saw Kate on campus about two or three months ago, and she said that she had an event coming up, and uh, I put it on the calendar then. I'm delighted to make good on that promise and be here with you. Thank you very much. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the transition. You've seen the, the headlines. Uh, you come to us on the edge of, uh, on the following uh, uh, kind of the American celebration of uh, democracy and the inauguration and peaceful transfer of power from one elected civilian to another. And there's something that's very um, uh, symbolic about that transfer and very much in keeping with a routine that goes back 200 years. But then also, somehow it's all very different. And, and I think we are all in a period of adjustment, mainly because of uh, uh, come to us at, a, at the end of a hard fought uh, election campaign and an interesting case where um, a, a true uh, outsider, someone without uh, uh, governmental experience, has come uh, to hold the uh, uh, position of uh, president and is tapping new uh, networks of people, uh, uh, mostly from the private sector, to take on positions of authority in the new government. So that has, in the federal workforce and civil servants, uh, following two things. Everything uh, President Trump says and everything that he does. Uh, so uh, we're in the midst, first of all, of the confirmation hearings. So my new boss, the Secretary of State, uh, to which the aid administrator will report, his confirmation, he'll be voted on later on today. Uh, similar, so all the federal agencies are watching the confirmation hearings. They're also watching uh, the issuance of executive orders for indications of what the new policy of the new government is. So like you, we're often uh, spectators to this, but waiting for our, our marching orders. Uh, we will, uh, so you come at a time of, of anticipation and some anxiety. If you're able to return here in six months, it'll have a different feel to it. It'll be a new uh, administration taking office and moving forward. So I just wanted to give you a kind of a what the week in Washington feels like to the folks that you're seeing here. A lot of watching and waiting and anticipation of what to do next. Um, so let me move on to the, the security and development nexus. And I, I just wanted to um, make some observations about how, in our experience as a donor uh, organization, how we see the communities moving closer to cl and closer together. I think there are at least four uh, uh, venues in which we see the security and development actors moving closer together. Some of this is not new, and some of this you'll recognize right away. The first one is in the context of complex humanitarian uh, disasters. So uh, in uh, the development arm of the United States, we have a fairly robust developed uh, uh, 
mechanism for responding to international disasters around the world. The point of departure for that or the office responsible for that is within the development mission. It is the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance that operates worldwide. It operates in countries despite whether we have a positive political relationship with that country or not, we uh, respond or at least offer assistance. So we have uh, assisted uh, uh, earthquake victims in Iran, even if we didn't have uh, uh, a uh, positive political relationship. We've offered assistance to North Korea and provide food assistance to North Korea. We offer assistance to uh, Cuba. Uh, and I see that as those are areas where there is a high level of cooperation. Uh, on the civilian side. When that becomes an overwhelming disaster, as was the case in Haiti in 2010, it swamps the civilian cap capability. And so we call on the military to assist, mostly with moving material and people to sites of disaster. Uh, it's far more expensive when the military gets involved, but we will operate jointly in the context of complex humanitarian uh, operations. The second area is, I would call, um, sort of uh, peacekeeping or peace agreement enforcement. And uh, that will be more familiar to you all who are uh, troop contributing co uh, countries for uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, where the development community uh, usually gets involved is where there is a formal peace agreement that's arrived at. Uh, as I just said, I was, uh, uh, came up through the Latin America side, and so my experience with that was peacekeeping in Central America uh, pursuant to a peace accord. Where we're most uh, closely attached is on the uh, topic of um, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Uh, by law and policy, we generally don't get directly involved with people in uniforms. We ask the uniforms to disarm other uniformed or, un uh, or uh, non-uniformed combatants, and then we get about the uh, process of individual demobilization or uh, community uh, demobilization and reintegration. But that first D, the disarmament, we leave to uh, military actors. And most uh, that is most uh, effectively done in the context of a, uh, a peace agreement. And you all have examples from the African continent, but are also aware around the world of the, uh, the peacekeeping operations uh, that we get involved in. Um, a, a somewhat smaller part of our interaction is in the area of um, civilian control of the military. And we at AID, uh, for uh, some time in a very small way, have talked about the ability to train civilians who are uh, charged with oversight of the military. So that might be training programs for parliamentarians or journalists who cover national security affairs or uh, academics or think tanks that uh, uh, work in the area of uh, civilian control of the military. Not a lot of money devoted to that, but the idea would be that uh, we believe uh, firmly in the, the uh, principle of civilian control of the military, but oftentimes the civilians uh, are, are um, uh, not informed or not trained up to exercise their proper role uh, of oversight, whether those are parliamentarians or uh, in terms of citizens who know how military works. Often the military is uh, a black box, an unknown, how militaries are run and therefore how do you oversee them. And so uh, from time to time we've gotten involved in civilian control of the military, uh, support of that. And then finally, and most recently, where we show up together is really in the uh, execution of joint um, military and state building operations. And so if the case was that uh, an AID development worker would only run into someone in uniform uh, around a complex emergency in the 80s and 90s, in the last two decades, more likely to have served together jointly in either Iraq or Afghanistan, where there were uh, parallel missions of uh, on the military side, providing security and kind of an umbrella and, and a ability to access the people directly and work on an assistance mission that had to do with both reactivating the economy and uh, building up uh, governing institutions. And, and what we found in that true security development uh, nexus is that one cannot proceed without the other. 
Uh, we, uh, when I started at the agency, we would always assume that for development to occur, you had to have a permissive environment, that we would not go into a situation if there was active hostilities. That still is largely the case, but we have moved very much to the front of the line in terms of areas with uh, active hostilities going on and where there are green zones that have been secured, yellow zones that are subject to uh, a military threat, and then red zones where we pretty much can't go. The, the security side of that says that we need something going on uh, uh, economically or politically that uh, gives people a stake and helps with the security mission. And so they both support and work in a symbiotic way uh, for success. Uh, and that remains kind of an enduring challenge in those two countries, and we see it more and more. So uh, it's been harder in the last year to separate those, those roles. Um, so those four areas are where the security and development, how we've experienced those coming together. Let me talk about some uh, challenges. I was uh, looking at your uh, framing paper, which I think sets out a lot of this information. Uh, I want to just talk about three challenges that we see jointly, I think, and you will encounter in development of your uh, national security strategies. The first is fragility, and the concept of fragility is one that is gaining a lot of currency, mostly because uh, in looking at our own national security strategy, we see less of a threat from aggressive states uh, moving on each other uh, for the conquest of territory. Not that are, that is not occurring, but in terms of a main orienting threat um, that still um, uh, is a minority of cases or, or isolated cases, uh, but more the threat of states that are um, uh, faced with either a crisis of legitimacy or effectiveness. And let me just throw out our definition of fragility. And fragility is described by the relationship between a state and society that produces outcomes that are either, uh, that are both effective and viewed as legitimate. And so if you think about fragility as a sort of effectiveness plus legitimacy uh, will give you, uh, uh, or deficits in, that are in those two areas is what are the sources of fragility. So you have cases where there are well-meaning, uh, well-intentioned governments popularly elected but are unable to produce those outcomes that folks view as either effective or legitimate. Or there are malign actors that actually, instead of producing bad government, or good government, or producing bad government, they're viewed as illegitimate. Uh, even if they're effectively delivering goods and services, they don't have the support of the people. Or in the worst case, the truly fragile state, they, uh, the relationships between state and society produce outcomes that are neither viewed as effective or legitimate, and therefore the state fails. Uh, those are seen as the kind of uh, emerging security threats in the next uh, uh, period that we're facing. Uh, compounding that challenge is what you hear and really is the, the hot button issue around town is the, the fight against violent extremism in, in all its form. So I think it's important uh, that we don't restrict that to the uh, Africa uh, continent. Uh, we see this in uh, forms of violent extremism throughout the world, whether that's in Indonesia or the Philippines or uh, 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 throughout Asia, or the uh, excessive gang violence that we see in Central America, that those forms of violent expression outside the norms of, uh, of political, social, economic discourse, folks uh, uh, using violence to advance their, uh, their missions. Uh, so that confronts us as development actors and security actors, and it is still a, 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 a challenge that threatens the security, I think, of all nations. The last challenge is to do this in a context of increasing globalization, uh, where uh, ideas, words, information travels uh, almost instantaneously and across borders. And so uh, the, and that is teamed with technology, which is really seen as a two-edged sword. Uh, great advances in development are, are furthered and always have been by growth in technology, but you also see the, uh, the uh, dark side of, of technology in terms of the ability to uh, compromise privacy, to uh, um, uh, surveil, 
uh, individuals and to uh, impinge on individual rights. Uh, so while it has uh, the ability to bring people together, it also has the ability to drive them apart. And so the twin edges of globalization and technology. Lastly, let me turn to three tools that I think are equally applicable to uh, the analysis of national security. They're all in, well, at least two of them are sort of in the analytical sphere. Um, Development relies oftentimes on uh, what's known as systems analysis, uh, the idea that we do not take apart um, problems and fight symptoms. We try to understand the whole uh, operating uh, universe in which a, a, an activity occurs. So in the defense realm or in the security realm, we often look at, uh, take a systems approach to the areas of, of security and justice. It's not just the military mission, but how does the mission of the security interact with law enforcement, interacting with the courts, interacting with the laws that the parliament makes, interacting with the local bar association and judges. So that when we take a systems approach, we're looking at all those actors. The analogy I like to use is sort of like a spider web. And when you pull on one, any part of that web, it'll affect the whole thing. It'll call it closer, it'll react uh, in a systemic way to any stimulus to that system. And so the idea of using systems analysis to understand not just your role or your uh, institution's uh, mission, but to understand that in the context of all the actions uh, it has on the rest of the entire systems, we find is very, very helpful. Uh, a second tool is sort of uh, political economy. And when I think about political, that's my own academic background and, and training is in political economy, is really about who holds power what are the patterns and interactions that that uh, relationship uh, creates, and then how does it impact the society? And I, I think that's somewhat fuzzy and, and uh, theoretical, but it comes down to a very simple proposition. In a given country, who holds power? What are those relationships? What manifest those relationships? How do those in power act? Who wins and who loses? And I think we find in analyzing countries around the world that that pattern is pretty easy to discern from talking to citizens and talking to uh, scholars both internal to that system and externally to understand um, through history and through uh, the political sciences, um, how did that governance bargain occur? and how does it manifest itself. So political economy analysis is one tool that we use to better understand the environments in which we work. Also that political economy is not uh, static. It is always changing. There is an inter, uh, uh, a, uh, entrance and exit of actors. Uh, there are also international forces that are played that affect a local political economy. The last tool, and I think that it's uh, equally applicable no matter where you are and what country you sit, is that uh, national security is now very fundamentally seen as a, a whole of government approach, that we need civilian and military actors working together to solve these issues. That's part of the systems analysis, but it's also um, an understanding that no one institution of government or interaction with society is capable of addressing all the challenges. And so uh, we've had, I think, a very rapid uh, uh, evolution in the idea that for U.S. national security policy, it rests on the pillars of defense, diplomacy, and development, and that that has meant a real uh, rise in the place of development to inform our considerations of our interactions with other countries and that the development mission needs to be uh, heard uh, and uh, the voices need to be uh, uh, heard. But also the tools, and part of the aim, I think, of this uh, discussion is to say what tools of the development trade are applicable in the analysis and execution of the security mission. Uh, why don't I leave it there and open it up to questions and uh, hope for the arrival of our second speaker.